Good morning. This is Dr. David Fox speaking on behalf of Project CHI, which is the Crisis Intervention, Trauma, and Bereavement Department of CHI Lifeline. We are going to be speaking this morning about coping with and dealing with your reactions, our children's, and our students' reactions to the tragic situation that has come to us from Virginia. In a few months, we are going to be davening before HaKadosh Baruch Hu on Yamim Neroyim, and we're going to be crying out Mi Bamayim, Mi Baesh, Mi Bamagefa, and the other frightening and unspeakable situations in which Jewish people so tragically find themselves. When we look at Aish, we look at Magefa, we look at Cherev, and all of those other gruesome types of horrific tragedy, we readily recognize that Aish fire is a destructive force. And we know that Amagefa is a very dangerous factor. But when we think about Mayim, our first reaction is not one of unimaginable horror or of Sakana. We think about the seaside we think about a swim in the calm waters of the beach. We think about a camp enjoying the ocean. And we don't think of Mayim as an environment where there can be takana or sudden tragedy. We are now contending with the sad and frightening information that one of our own, a good man, a rabbi of Bauman, in an act of protecting and saving a camper and succeeding at that, then disappeared at sea. We do not yet know of the outcome of this tragedy, but it is a tragedy nonetheless, not only because there is a person missing, not only because there were campers present at that time, and not only because he has family, wife, and children, community people really around the Jewish globe who are connected to him and praying for him. But it's also a much more amplified tragedy because it happened by Mayan. It happened in an environment under conditions where no one expected this unthinkable event. No one was prepared, no one would anticipate that under the conditions of a calm seashore, that there should be a sudden, tragic, disastrous condition of a good person loved by so many people who has disappeared. And it's precisely because of this unexpected quality it's precisely because no one ever would imagine that the waters immediately offshore would pose any threat or risk 
it's because of that completely uncanny and hard to believe and hard to accept tragedy that we are all now literally in the whirlpool of shock and even disbelief. And this is what separates one level of crisis into another type of crisis known as a trauma because no one has a reference point for this. No one would think of this happening. And yet here we are responding, me bamayim, how could this happen? And we're not going to focus in today's discussion, which will first be my giving some general guidelines and then opening this up for your own questions, but we're not going to focus on the Dhammans or on the campers or on the community, but instead we do want to look at our own reactions. We do want to be attentive to the reactions in students, in our own children, and to develop some pointers for addressing the reactions that so many people are having, which probably constitute some level of traumatization. And I'm going to describe the common range, the normal range of reaction when the brain, the heart, and the nisham itself, the soul itself, is facing the unspeakable, the unthinkable, the unimaginable. And we're going to look at what goes on inside of ourselves as very normal reactions to an abnormal event. We're not going to talk so much right now of the visual of the scene, because there is an entire community, there's an entire camp, there's family, there are friends down in that area who very tragically witnessed what happened and they're stunned and they're going through their reactions. But we want to talk about this morning our own reactions and to understand them a little bit better. And we not only do react to horrible news, but we're supposed to react. It is normal to pause and then to recognize that inside the mind, inside of the heart, inside the neshama, and sometimes even affecting our behavior, that we're undergoing something very, very troubling. And, and let's look at that, that spectrum of reaction. So that those of you who are parents, those of you who are teachers, can be more attentive to your kids during this time. And those of you who are finding yourself reacting yourselves as adults so that you can also be in tune with yourself and recognize what's going on inside the brain and the heart and inside sometimes of the body also. Because this is unexpected and because it involves a sakana to a very good person's life, we classify this as a traumatic event. And a traumatic event means that it's a type of thing that not only are we not prepared for, but we know that we ourselves personally have not gone through what Rabbi Bauman has experienced. And any time that a human being, no matter of their madrega, no matter of how invested they are and committed they are, hashkafically, no matter how old they are, any time a person's exposed to a tragic event that is regarded as a trauma, you're going to go through an adjustment process. Some of the common reactions, and when I say common, this is not to trivialize nor to minimize what any of you are experiencing, but nonetheless, one of the common reactions to hearing dreadful news is obviously to worry. And the worry takes place as trying to visualize what must have happened and the fright 
and the dread of could this happen to ourselves or to someone that we love. And the worry and the anxiety can take the form of fearfulness, which means we're not going to go near the water, we're not going to go in the swimming pool, we're not going to go on a boat ride. And the anxiety can take the form just just as pure physiological distress. Uh, people who hear this type of event and people who try to visualize it, and certainly those who know the family or who know members of the community down there, um, certainly we go through moments of rapid heartbeat, of feeling very sleepy, of feeling very agitated, of not wanting to eat, sometimes feeling nauseous, sometimes feeling headachy. But one of the very common anxiety reactions to hearing dreadful news is to internalize it. And the body goes on automatic pilot and it generates symptoms of physical change. And if this is going on with you or this is going on with your children and your students, be attentive to it. Most of these reactions are temporary and with encouragement and with support and with an opportunity to verbalize what you're going through or what your child is going through and then responding supportively, which is what we call validation. Validation means we don't try to talk a person out of what they're experiencing, but we don't tell them they shouldn't feel that way. We don't tell them to stop it. But instead, we acknowledge that one very, very common form of reaction to horrible, scary news is to become scared. And for that type of anxiety to show up in some of the ways that we just described. It's also very, very frequent that people who hear tragedy, who hear about loss, or probable loss or impending loss, uh, become sad and become depressed. I know that sounds obvious, but we don't always pick up on the obvious signs when we're going through them ourselves. And, and monitor that. You may find yourself detached, or you may find that your kids, your children are withdrawing, or you may find that emotionally you're subdued, or that nothing excites you, you don't want to do anything fun, you don't want to seek any diversion. And that is one of the reactions, that is a mood or depression reaction. And it's entirely normal under the abnormal circumstance of being exposed to tragedy. And again, if you, your children, your loved ones, your friends, express or appear to display signs of withdrawal and of a somber mood or a flatness with no emotional expression. So this too needs to be articulated. We, we prompt a person in distress to speak with a trusted person, a stable trusted person. It may be a parent, it may be a close friend, it may be a teacher or a Rebbe or Ebbetson, but to talk it through because people generally don't go into deep depressions or deep states of not functioning when they're encountering someone else's tragedy, but rather this is a means that the brain and the mind have of trying to adapt to sad news. And it's very, very common it's very normal and common to find that many of us actually lapse into the state of malaise or depression because we're sad and we don't know what to do with horrible news. It's also very common, particularly among observant Jews who take their faith very seriously and who take their religion as an essential part of our daily daily life, it's very common to have what we're going to call existential questions. And it doesn't necessarily mean that a person's deeply pondering things, although they may be, but it does mean that one thing that the mind 
very quickly and reflexively goes into is why did it happen? What's the meaning of it? And why did he deserve this? Or why did his family have to be going through this? And people are going to normally, normally, naturally, at times, go into that thought process, generating questions, wondering why. And even your children, it's not so common among younger children, but among teens, it does happen. They're going to struggle with religious doubts and with questions. And this is normal. This is one way the mind has of reacting. And if that's what's going on with the student or the children or yourself or your spouse, if that's what's going on, so recognize that that is a normal level of reaction. And we don't have answers to those questions that begin with why. And we certainly are not in a position to draw conclusions about why this happened to someone else. This is not our question. This is not up to us to sort of it. But if you or your children are struggling at that level with the spiritual, with the religious uncertainties and questions, they are normal and they deserve your addressing them if you can, if you're in a position where you can have that dialogue with someone in a way that's supportive and a way that's compassionate and understanding and do it. And if you can't, so those are the types of reactions to tragedy where you want to direct the struggling person, whether it's to a teacher or whether it's to a mentor or to a mashpia, but to someone who they respect who will listen to them and who will be supportive. But again, provided that we don't try to come up with pat answers because we don't know. That's not the direction that we're going to take in coping in the aftermath of tragedy. I'm going to wrap up prior to listening to some questions with the recommendation that we do acknowledge that it is normal to react, whether in mood, whether in thought, whether in body, or even sometimes in behavior. And it is normal also at times, particularly for teens and adults, to be struggling with questions. And this is a normal part of what's known as the ripple effect. We also refer to this as secondary traumatization when the person having the reaction was not there, did not experience it, but empathically identifies, connects with what it must be like to go through that. And whatever level or combination of levels that you and your children and your students are going through, give them a chance to talk it through. Be supportive. Don't answer, but listen and validate. Don't try to take it away, but do give them the sense of hope and encouragement that with the days that pass, each person's experiences will begin to shift, will begin to diminish. It is very uncommon for children or for adults who were not direct survivors or witnesses to the event, but again, are secondarily involved. It is very common for the distress to diminish within the course of about a week, sometimes a little more, a little, little bit longer. At any point, if you're not sure how to navigate it or how to address it or you have questions, any one of you, any time, can call the Project Chai call-in crisis line. And the number there is 8553. That's the, the number three. And then the word crisis, C-R-I-S-I-S, 8553 crisis. We continue our tefillahs, our hearts, and our souls are directed towards the Bauman family and to their community during this perilous time of uncertainty. Our reactions are indicative of who we are as a nation, as a religion. And be patient with yourself, be understanding of your child, and 
within the passage of the next few days, most of the symptoms of distress will begin to, to subside, God willing. I'm going to pause now, and we're going to uh, instruct you about unmuting in the event you have specific questions. Um, you are welcome to ask questions, although highly personal ones that are unique to you or to your family member may not be the most appropriate ones during this particular call, although you can call the 855 number if you want subjectively focused uh, guidance. But if there are general questions, trying to understand, trying to conceptualize, or seeking some type of guideline for getting through this interval, uh, this would be a very fine time for you to unmute and to pose those questions. To unmute yourself, you could press star six. Anyone that wants to ask a question could unmute themselves by pressing star six. But when you're done asking your question, don't forget to mute yourself again. Can we ask a question now? Please, yes. I'm sorry? Yes, please go ahead. If we know the family very well, how does Dr. Fox recommend we give we give the most support we possibly can? That's a very wonderful and sensitively directed question. And I will repeat the question. If someone can I, re knows can I repeat the question? No, I will repeat the question okay. for everyone. But if if someone has a personal relationship with the Bauman family, how can they show them support at this point? What I would recommend is that today, because this day, um, in in part because of some halachic decisions that are being made, and also because of the intensity of what they are going through since Rabbi Bauman's disappearance, I would suggest that you not reach out. Um, they are processing something very, very difficult, um, and this may not be the, the opportune time to reach out. However, in the days ahead, whether it's through email message, whether it's through text, whether it's through written communication, um, it would be most proper to offer them words of support. Um, what we find is that the more commonplace, and I will say trite statements, um, are not helpful, meaning it's not helpful for someone in this situation to get a message that I know what you're going through or he's in a better place. Some of the routine, um, well-intended uh, statements are not helpful. Um, asking questions to them is not helpful, whether they're um, sensitive things like, how are you doing? That's a sensible question, but not a helpful one. Or uh, questions that are seeking information are, are also distracting and are not welcome. Um, if you have something to offer, don't ask them if you can offer it, but rather if there's something you want to do for them, say that I'm going to be doing X and Y. I'm going to be sending meals. Um, I'll be there to take up carpool for you. Whatever it might be, the practical nation, don't offer it in the sense that do you want me to help with X and Y? But if you sincerely you are in a situation where you can offer direct support and help, then just say this is what I'm going to do. Um, but I would suggest over the next, certainly through the end of today through tomorrow, that you not um, uh, uh, do a lot of phone calling. Uh, they need their privacy. They need the time to process. But in the many days ahead, um, whereas we hope for a more positive outcome, in the days ahead they will need your, they will need your supportive checking in. Keep all phone calls brief and recognize that only with the passage of time will this family really begin to deal with the impact of what's gone on. If there are other questions, please do go ahead and unmute. 
Can I ask a question? Hello? Sorry. Can I ask a question? Please. Hello? please. As a as mm-hmm. a camp as a camp director. Um, yeah, hang on one sec. I'm gonna put my my volume up so I can hear you. Give me one sec. Okay, please st- start again. As head staff at a camp, um, we yeah. have a boy who's um, refusing to swim because of what occurred. Um, how are we to respond? Sure. So let's understand that that is a behavioral display of his fear. It's it's not an abnormal reaction that many times when something scary has gone on, there is a reflex to avoid something reminiscent uh, of the tragedy situation. Uh, if you can imagine someone who is has to show in a car accident being afraid to go in the car or to walk near the curb on a busy street. So this is no different than that. And I would suggest that for most children that you accommodate that for a couple of days, meaning that you let him have his day out of the pool. Um, It's not gonna, under ideal circumstances, disrupt the rest of the camp. No one should tease him. No one should pressure him. Um, Keep him busy with some other activity uh, during swimming time. Um, but uh, perhaps in a day or two to talk it through with him, give him maximum reassurance about the safety in the pool, about the presence of the lifeguard, um, about how his friends will help him readjust, instruct some of his good buddies in camp, uh, his bunk mates, um, instruct them to make it easy on him, uh, to go in there with him. Uh, but it is... Uh, not an abnormal reaction uh, to avoid the type of situation that's reminiscent of someone else's tragedy. But I think in a day or two, you'll talk it through with him. Um, If you see that his fears are generalizing and there are more things he's avoiding or he's withdrawing more, that would be uh, a good thing to call in our crisis line. And one of our interventionists can prompt you to take some follow-up steps with him. Thank you. Sure. Next question, please. Other questions? Hello. Hello. <laughs> yes. Go ahead. Hi. Just a quick question. Um, from a far distance, um, children in elementary school have heard about it in our family, and didn't follow it. Just heard it briefly, with some fear. Um, and they never asked about it again. It was never spoken about again. Is it important to go back and discuss it or bring it up? Or is it important to go back to it? Or if they don't ask, don't go back to it again. Okay, that's also an important question. What are the ages, please? Let's say seven, eight. Okay, so let's make a general uh, assumption that children are seven or eight. They do think, they do internalize, they are curious, and they wonder about things and they worry about things. And um, if they brought it up and are not talking about it again, um, it <coughs> would be approach, would be appropriate for a parent to make the preemptive overture and to say to those children, um, you'd ask some questions the other day, um, I have some more information and this would be a good time to talk about it. And you you ask the children if they have any questions or they've heard things that they're confused about, um, it's perfectly okay and it's also important for them to talk about it with a caring parent. Um, At that age, I would not go into many detail. I would not overdo it, um, but I would acknowledge that there was uh, the incident and you could explain to them that that in attempting to rescue a a child, which Barfitchin succeeded at, um, that he was struggling in the water and that they've been looking for him. Um, And I'd I'd keep it to that. And then let them ask questions 
most questions deserve an answer, but at that age, I would keep it to data, meaning brief fact, if you can, if you know the answer. Um, I would not go into elaborate discussions unless you see the child is very troubled and, and wants to talk about his or her uh, personal reaction. Um, and if you don't know the answer to something, then tell the child, I don't know right now. I will find out, and when I do, I'll share it with you. Uh, but in that age range, if they ask questions, they, they do need information. They need, they, they need data. Um, you want to see how they're internally handling it. But because it was brought up already, even though it's been dropped now, um, we would recommend that you do give them an opportunity to talk further about it so that whatever they're thinking or feeling isn't being suppressed inside uh, where it can lead to more confusion. And if they ask, was he found, we should answer that. Okay, so in the event that we get any confirming report either way, if that becomes public knowledge, so then you respond accordingly. Um, okay. we, are, we are waiting still for there to be um, a formal statement of what the PSAC is, um, and the PSAC will be made in due time based in part on what the facts turn out to be, um, but only at that point when we have a confirmation one way or the other um, should you go into that. Um, but we, we don't want to, on the one hand, build up uh, lofty hopes in a child. Um, we, on the other hand, we don't want to be morbid with a child. And you can say at this time that we still don't have that information. But when we do, we'll talk it over with you. We'll share it with you. And you also want to tell children, by the way, I alluded to this, but you want to tell children that if they're hearing stuff in the street, if their friends are talking, if they hear information and they don't know whether or not it's true, so then before repeating it to their friends, they should first check in with you. Unfortunately, the way we rumor, the way we gossip, not only children but adults too, sometimes the most um, exaggerated and grotesque uh, distortions of fact, uh, the, the most unusual speculations of fact come out. And if your children are hearing things, frightening things or, or miraculous things, if they don't know that they're fact, they should uh, be encouraged to share it with you first and then they'll check into it. Thank you. Thank you, too. Um, can I ask, my 12-year-old uh, is in sleepaway camp now, and I'm wondering if I should get in touch with the camp and let her know we we know the Baumans personally. <clears throat> okay. Uh, how how old is your your child? Twelve. Okay. So look, I, I think we have to assume in our media accessing Jewish world that this will get to camps, this will get to yeshivas, this will get to seminaries, and it's probably very, very well publicized already. So I don't think we can make an assumption wherever your, your daughter's at camp that she won't hear this or that the counselors or the directors of the camp don't know about this. Um, I think it would be okay to talk with the, her counselor or the head counselor um, about what is being said so far to the campers, what do they know? Um, and then ask the counselor, um, has she noticed with your daughter, is your daughter reacting to what she's heard? Um, if she has shown signs of distress, then it's perfectly in order to have a consoling, supportive a phone call with her uh, at that age. Um, if, on the other hand, um, she hasn't reacted to it, but she's heard the news, um, I think it still would be uh, appropriate for you to check in with her and to have a call with her. But if you're going to do that, meaning if you're the one who's going to be sharing the news for the first time and you're going to be discussing with your daughter, I would strongly suggest that you advise the counselor that that is going to take place 
so that the counselor can keep an eye on her. So I, I've spoken to the head counselor there, and they, they told me that they're really trying to keep it hush-hush. They don't want to worry any of the younger campers. So the kids that do know have been spoken to and have been told not to say anything. I'm just concerned that something may be slipped, and she may find out, and she is a bit of a worrier. Mm-hmm. And being that it's her first year away in camp, which is already difficult for her, if if it's something that I should nip in the bud or just leave as is, and just if, if she does find out, then she'll call me. I don't know. Okay, so, so look, my premise as a traumatologist is that information of this magnitude and gravity gets out. There are very few secrets in the world and fewer secrets in the Jewish world, especially when something tragic is going on. So um, I, from my point of view, I would not uh, rely on older campers not to let it slip. And I think that your concern is very in place. Um, I do understand, on the other hand, that the camp doesn't want to distress younger kids, and especially a girl who's away from home for the first time, and she's by herself, uh, without obviously without family around. Uh, this might be difficult for her. I still would talk it over with the head counselor, explaining that you do have a familial connection with the Bellmans, um, and that you are concerned that when your child discovers it, that um, she may react to it, and she probably will. Um, so if the camp absolutely says we are not disclosing to the younger kids, so then tell or ask the counselor instead that if your daughter does find out about it and is reacting, that they should notify you so that you can do what you can remotely to talk her through her reaction. So in other words, I'm suggesting you don't fly in the face of the camp policy because right. they 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 have their formula what what they want to do, uh, but you still uh, share information with the head counselor. So in the event that your daughter hears about this, as I'm quite sure she will, that they'll keep an eye on her and they will tell her. Um, why don't we set up a phone call with you and your mother? All right. Okay. Thank so be you. Be proactive as a parent. It was a, it was a very important question you asked. Thank you so much. Dr. I Fox, a... if my 11-year-old is asking, how do I know, Tati, I'm afraid that you're going to die, Chassel. how do you respond to a child with that question? Yeah. So it happens uh, even without the precipitant of someone else's tragic uh, circumstance that is something that children wrestle with um, and your job is not to talk them out of it ironically meaning your job is not to give them 50 reasons why it's not going to happen um, but your job instead is to give them affection and to say that when uh, when parents and children love each other and care each other sometimes we have those those scary thoughts. Sometimes we worry about it. Um, so make it an emotional connecting moment. And at her age, at that child's age, you can also make it a spiritual learning moment where you model for her about the, the application of bitachon, meaning kids at that age, they sort of heard the word. They may not know much about what it means to place faith in HaKadosh Baruch Hu, but here you have a teaching opportunity to say that our bitachon, let's talk about how to exercise in the play of bitachon, and our bitachon is that we trust that all that HaKadosh Baruch Hu does with each of us is what's right, and we know that we have a job which is to be good, to be kind, to be doing mitzvahs, um, for for children and parents to be close, for there to be respect in the home. And we do all of those things. And we pray that Hashem continues to show us his care also. Um, and, and you sort of deftly circumvent addressing 
uh, yes, one day I will die. No, I'm not going to die. Or my physical came back. Thing. You don't get into that type of information. But instead, you, you focus on the bonding and the closeness. You focus on teaching them the application of showing faith and trusting Kodesh Baruch will always take care of us. And then letting your child know that any time they have fears, any time they worry about things, you want them to do exactly that. You want them to come over to you, and you're going to listen. You will never judge them. You will never criticize them. And and let them talk it through with you. If your child is tearful, give them a hug. Um, if your child at nighttime is really worrying more about these things because they don't have day, daytime distractions, one or another parent goes into the bedroom at night, uh, reads them a story or tells them the story, says Krishna with them, puts a nightlight on if they need it. But um, you can't zap away that worry because it's not unusual or abnormal worry, uh, but you can show them acceptance of, of being there, open to talking about it, um, reinforcing that they came over and discussed it with you, um, and um, show them a lot of affection and caring. That's very helpful. And how do you share Hashem's caring for us at a time when a father is taken from his family, Chas Hashem, and, and he doesn't see Hashem's caring for that person who went to save another life? Yeah, and that's what we call before, that theological conflict. Um, most of the time, um, I can say this pretty confidently, um, that's not the direction preteens take. In other words, they don't take the in Cain Lamaza Anarchy, they don't take the Alicia Benavuya uh, type of re reaction. Most preteens and younger kids don't think in that direction. Most of them don't make that empathic um, connecting and why did it happen to someone else. They are more focused about themselves not wanting something like that to happen to me. Um, in the event that a child, an earlier age preteen child does go into that, I would not make it a long theological discourse with them. Um, I might um, validate the question and say that in, in some circumstances, um, people do have that question. And sometimes people struggle with those questions. and. Moshe Rabbeinu, according to Chazal, sometimes struggle with that type of question also. Um, and, and that's when our bitachen comes in, because our bitachen means that the part of us that's not sure, the part of our mind that's not entirely certain about something, that's the place where we turn to our bitachen and we say, um, I am going to continue to have faith even though I have questions. If there are no questions, then there's no need for the talking. But you can make that, as I said, a, a teaching moment for a, for a youngster, even a preteen, that this is how we, we implement our bitachan when we're dealing with suffering. Okay, I appreciate it. Thank you. For Rabbi Fox, question. Rabbi Fox. Yeah. Is there is there any is there any takeaway from this? Is there any lesson for kids like when we're speaking to them? Like, be careful. I I don't know. Is there any lesson that we can attach to to what happened? Okay. So look, there there, there are really two types of lessons. There's what I'm going to call the meaning lesson and the purpose lesson. And the meaning lesson is when a person wrestles inside of their mind, inside of their soul, and they're trying to have some framework for making sense of this. And, and what was the meaning of this? And, and why did it happen? So number one, that doesn't come quickly. That takes sometimes many years for a person to sit back and say, what the meaning that I can take away from a tragedy, whether it was their own or whether someone else's. So that's a long process. And we encourage children and we encourage adults for sure, definitely teenagers, that, that that's a 
that's an acceptable pursuit, but searching for the meaning of the event, um, but it's not one that happens rapidly. It, making sense of something takes ages. And we can't find the meaning of why it happened to someone else, although we ourselves sometimes can find some perspective on it, but it may not be the perspective that the Bauman family has on it. So the, the meaning quest, that's a long, long process. The purpose quest, um, which is what practically do I want to do differently because of what has happened to them? So that's called purpose, meaning that I went through this and what I'm going to make purposeful from coping with someone else's tragedy. So it varies with age, but usually purpose can range from anything like um, I'm going to um, daven harder, or I'm going to learn for his neshama, or I'm going to do mitzvahs and give tzedakah, or I'm going to raise money for a project to help people. So, so purpose, which means what can I do to help me cope with what's happened? What can I do that's positive, that will make a contribution, that will make a difference at some level? Um, and, and make sure that the that, that two things are in place. Number one, that whatever they accept upon themselves is age appropriate. Obviously, we don't want a six-year-old saying, I'm going to raise $1,000. Um, and we don't want a 10-year-old saying, I'm going to learn through shots this week. Um, so make sure it's age appropriate and it's doable. And make sure that they don't do it as a neder which means that they don't make an absolute commitment that they're going to absolutely do this 100%. Prompt them instead that the purposeful activity is something they do that's short term, which means I'm going to work this week on saying one more capital to them. Or um, me and my chavrusa, we're going to makabal the during afternoon seder the first 10 minutes, we're not going to have any Bittal Torah. But make sure that they're bite-sized, doable, short-term things without, without being the Kabul Neder. Um, and make sure that the purposeful act that they choose um, is something that will leave them feeling fulfilled. That they made a difference, they made a contribution, they implemented healthy change. Thank you. That was very helpful. One last, just one last question. Would it be fair to say that a takeaway would be that, that campers need to be very careful or always listen to counselors or always just, you know, you know, not to do anything dangerous or anything like that? Or you think that that's unfair to mix the this with that lesson? I have trouble hearing the question. Would you try me one more time, please? Would, would, would you say that it would be fair that a takeaway should be that the campers you know, campers or children should always be careful. You know, when you know when 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 doing a camp activity, and always should listen to counselors. Or do you think that that would be an un, not an appropriate time to give that lesson? Okay, that's a very very good question. We have been of the mindset in in High Lifeline and Project High that camp safety is something that should always be addressed, even before the first uh, camp activity to educate children and counselors about the many, many things they need to be cautious about. Um, I think your question is great because we don't want to imply by making a focus on safety that, that somehow what happened in Virginia was because of negligence or lack of safety. We don't want to go there. We don't want to imply anything of that sort. So we don't want anyone to take it as a cause and effect that, that the reason that you're stressing safety is because Hasselstrom, someone wasn't being careful. That's not the way to go. Um, but I do think um, there can be a subtle introduction um, of the basic rules of safety, which means not to go someplace without permission, not to go on an activity alone unless you're with a group of people, um, not to wander into territory that your counselor doesn't want you to go into, um, and to always make sure that there's a responsible adult 
who is in vicinity. I think that can be introduced as generalities in a subtle way, um, but certainly not in a way that's going to make children uptight and afraid to move. Got it. Thank you. Thank you, too. Okay, we have time for two more questions. Um, I have a question, if that's okay. Um, there are those in the community that are having simchos bar Hashem. And how do we translate that, I guess, for ourselves and for our children, that there are simchos happening when the Baumans are suffering, many of us are suffering from this experience? How do we translate that, go about that? Yes, and and that's um, that's a fairly common question. Um, if someone is family or has a close relationship with the Baumans and just feels at this time they can't attend somebody else's simcha, so then that would be very understandable. Um, if this is a matter of just the, the more the emo on Achibat Sora, that, that we're not talking about family members or close friends. We're talking about just the general community. So um, certainly to go to one's own simcha is appropriate and is important. And even to attend someone else's simcha under the circumstances, you may be somewhat more subdued, uh, but we don't have a precedent in our minhagim to avoid um, an actual simcha shal mitzvah even though it's a time of someone else's distress, um, we we find a way inside of our our neshama to break a cup right after the chuppah, which is our uh, our um, commemoration of the fact that there is always going to be a sadness associated with our lives as you did in Gaulis, even though we're at a time of abject simcha. So uh, unless you, you or your family has a very direct personal connection and just don't feel right going, um, uh, I think we want to educate our kids that we don't um, interrupt somebody else's somebody else's simcha um, by by showing up in a somber way or by failing to attend it. Thank Any you. other question? You're welcome. Any other questions? Time for one last question. I have a question. I'm head staff at a camp. I don't feel that not my that the campers or or the single staff really know about this. Is it something we should tell them to inform the staff themselves? Right. Yeah, and we're talking about late teen, early yeah. twenty. Late yeah. Teen. Yeah. So again, even in the most uh, well insulated camp, there are phones, there are texting, uh, there there is access to information, um, and I, I think it would be somewhat naive for us to think that the word's not going to get out there. Um, I think it would be fine to have a a pre briefing for the staff and explain that this is what's happening in Kalei Yisrael. Um, I might wait a day or two as we wait to see, uh, as I said, outcome. Um, I think it's appropriate to have that information and um, that's so that they hear it factually rather than hear a distorted version. But it's also so that they can be attentive to any campers who may hear about it, um, and so that they can be consoling and they can be supportive during that camper's uh, reaction. But I do think this is all with the proviso that if you're going to have this pre-briefing with the responsible um, staff, that you do encourage them not to talk about it within audible range of the children. But this is not a time it would be irresponsible of them to share this with children at this time. Okay, thank you. All right, we should hear only Besoros Tovos, Yeshua's 
and the Hamas. And if anyone has any questions, it is perfectly fine to call our crisis line. Thank you. And have have a, a healthy and a safe, good summer. Amen.